Hello everyone, my name is Mirna and on behalf of the Mindalia TV team, welcome to Mindalia live streaming, where thousands of people around the world gather daily to see the lectures and interviews organized by Mindalia TV. Today with us, Angel Rebo, CEO, consultant, TV host, international public speaker and president of the Wisdom for Kids Foundation, is co-hosting with our dear Stan Sorensen. Stan is the president and founder of the Healing Exchange Center. Before starting with them, we want to remind you that Mindalia's mission is to share information that can help raise the level of consciousness around the world. And you can help us by subscribing to our channel, leaving us a positive comment on this video or sharing it with someone that you know that is gonna benefit of the content that we are gonna be discussing here today. Also, while we are live streaming, we have the active chat, the screen you're gonna be seeing here on our side. We invite you to participate with us. We also want to invite you to participate and collaborate with Mindalia with your own valuable content. And for that, you can go to our website. On the top, you're gonna to find the link that says collaborate with Mindalia. That link is gonna take you to a form that you can fill out and our technical team will be getting in contact with you. Remember that you can collaborate with Mindalia in Portuguese through Mindalia Televisao, in English through Mindalia TV English, as you already know, in Spanish through Mindalia Televisión. Visit us in our different platforms, go to our Facebook pages, Instagram's account, follow us. In that way, you not only help us reach as much people in the planet as possible, but you also keep yourself informed about the daily content that we are developing there. We are not gonna be delaying this any further, then I'm gonna leave you with Angel, with Stan, and our dear guest today, author and healer, Michael Nardi. Guys, welcome to my Dahlia live streaming. The screen is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mirna, for the introduction. And uh, welcome back to my Dahlia TV, Stan. How are you today? Oh, I'm very good. I'm just fine. It's a wonderful day. <laughs> Excellent. We can tell. We can tell for, by the sun and the light that is, uh, <laughs> is, is, is making you glow today, okay. Stan. Yeah, well, sometimes it, it, it makes me turn purple. <laughs> oh, look at that. I, I love I love purple, purple flames. <laughs> Maybe that's a way to start talking with our incredible uh, guest today, Michael. Hi, Michael. How are you? Wonderful. How are you? Very well, very well. Welcome. And apparently you guys, you have uh, you you have been in contact recently and uh, you felt uh, really, really uh, compelled to be here today. And I really, you know, bless you uh, for being here. And um, Stan, tell me, how did you get to know Michael? Well, it's really interesting. I didn't get to know Michael. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but, but about a month ago, you said you were going to, you said you were on your way to Mexico. Well, about a month ago, I was in Mexico uh, in a place called Teotihuacan, which is uh, the site of the uh, pyramids um where they say men become gods anyway i was there and michael was there and we were in this group together uh exploring the uh the pyramids exploring the concepts around uh, uh, uh toltec society that used to be there and the, the reality is I, I was kind of like distracted and I didn't get a chance to talk to Michael, but we did hug <laughs> on, <laughs> on a good. special place, a wisdom for the uh, elders or something. Uh, one of the places in the, uh, in the uh, Toltec, I mean the um, Teotihuacan uh, uh, pyramid site. And an odd thing, I saw Michael doing handstands. And I said, that's interesting. He's doing handstands. Um, and then somehow we exchanged information and I found him on Facebook and we became friends. So we're friends on Facebook, but I don't know anything about Michael. But I watched some of his um, stuff on Facebook. Some of it's live. He does live streaming. And I saw one article where he was uh, talking about an audio book that he was recording. And I said, wow, an audio book. So he's an author and he's doing an audio book. And I really want to know more about you, Michael. Uh, I want to know about your, your audio book. I want to know a lot. 
But my start off question is, same question I've been focusing on a lot is how in the world did you change from being just a normal person? Grow, did you grow up in Ashland, Oregon? No, I grew up in Cleveland, Ohio. Well, being a Cleveland, Ohio kid growing up, getting programmed, getting, getting domesticated, as one of our friends would say, at some point you decided to change and go different than a normal life. I can tell that about you. You got long hair. You do handstands on tops of pyramids. I, how did you get on your path? What was the defining moment? Well, it was uh, a call of action, and it came with my brother and myself. I lived in Cleveland, Ohio. I went to a little school in college, Mercyhurst uh, University. It used to be called Mercyhurst College. And I had a relationship with my my brother that was based on addiction. And that is how he came to accept me when I entered his world. And there was a day and a moment where I saw him and I, I thought that he had died. And I woke up the next morning after sitting and watching this. And I said, enough is enough. This, this I, I don't, I can't damage my heart anymore. And I made a choice in that moment to end it all, cold turkey everything, and start a new life based on love and acceptance. And that's the time that I came to read the Four Agreements by Don Miguel Ruiz, but more importantly, The Mastery of Love was his second book in the, the Toltec Wisdoms series. And that gave me the tools my intent was yearning for. So, you know, I'm sorry. So you were having this distressing, uh, moment where your life became into your focus and you needed to to make a decision to change it and it, so so out of despair in a sense you made a choice to do something different absolutely out of despair the decision and decision's a good word because once you make that decision in my life i found everything falls into focus much easier than when we talk about things, when we try to mull it over, when we try to go into a conversation. And it was, a, it was an act of power that came out of, yes, despair. I wanted more out of life. Growing up and being domesticated in Cleveland, Ohio, it was football, beer, good grades, and helping you know, the poor in the way they helped the poor. It wasn't an empowerment thing. It was that I was someone with something and I could give it to someone and that would help them. It wasn't to give them the opportunity to learn how to empower themselves. It was, I'm here and they're here. And there was something dysfunctional about that in my life that I didn't, I, I couldn't live and bear that. There had to be something more in life. There had to be a deeper meaning than sitting around and watching football and going to church. There wasn't something being nurtured deep inside that I always knew existed. That reminds me of a quote, uh, Give a man a fish and he'll eat for the day. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. I don't know if you've heard that quote. It's pretty popular. I, I have heard that quote. And that's my life work. How do, how do I teach them to fish? Yeah, how do I, yeah. And I, I have to start with myself. And that was the moment where I realized I was the problem. It wasn't my domestication. It wasn't where I grew up. It was what I had learned and what I was domesticating myself to do. So it was a time that I needed to change the way that I was treating myself. I didn't mu like myself very much at that point in time. And I was very successful in school, in relationships, I thought, on these external levels. But internally, when the lights were out, when there was no one around, when the last drink had been drunk, I didn't like who I was looking at in the mirror. Wow. And what was the process? How did you how do you get from that place that you just explained to be an author and to help people heal? The process started with with help. I mean, I had a mentor, um, a man named Dominico, who he, he just started listening to me. And I, I was sharing stories and I was I was uncensored. I wanted to sort of shock him. He was from Italy. So it was very um, culturally different. I, I was in a very fundamental place where everyone thought the same way and he was this odd entity 
this this thing and he he began gave me books asked me questions what it really meant to be spiritual things that i had never really asked in the way that he asked them and in that way throughout my time there was little little um signposts messages internally that i started listening to as the noise and the chatter in my mind went down i began to listen to messages more clearly that were from my heart from that silent whisper and from that when i listened to the messages it, it brought me closer and closer to what i was looking for and those messages i i even in these days is my goal to in, be internally led and keep on giving myself tools that can turn off the noise of the outside. Are, are you saying that you have become an odd entity? I am beyond odd. I was just having a conversation with my kids yesterday. We were having a, a heart to heart about various things around the, the kitchen table, Sunday meal. We share a gratitude and we were talking about we're odd. You know, I, I used to wear suits. I have, you know, tattoos all over my body now. I didn't have tattoos when I was young. Everyone suspects I skateboard my kids to school and I learned how to skateboard not when I was a kid. I learned eight months ago as a way to get my young son to learn to ride his bike. I'm odd and I share with them the odder the better and to be proud of that oddness and to celebrate your differences so that you can see the uniqueness of each person because we're all so odd. I mean, we have a commonality of love and patience and kindness. I, I believe the human spirit is kind and loving, but we all have very different stories, very different interests, very different passions. So yes, I, I would find myself as, a, as an odd something and my family falls in line with it, the four of us, our little team. I, I think that's a fascinating point of, that you just made about we're all odd. And I think what perhaps attracted you to your mentor was that he was odd and you're odd. And so you had at least a little affinity with oddness. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so you stuck around and listened to or talked to him and he listened to you and he helped you find new paths or new steps to take or new decisions to make. And now you're doing the same thing through your, yeah. body, through your handstands, through whatever. Well, it's a generational thing. We pass down this wisdom. And if someone sits with you and, and they have that gift that they give you, their time. I mean, it's one of the most important things that we can give someone, our time. And when someone gives you that time and it makes that much an effect in your life, what else could you possibly want to do but share that time with other people that have that same burning, that burning in their heart that they're yearning for? And all they really need to realize is this. Here's my mirror. Look back. That burning is inside you. I don't need to tell you how to get there. You know how to get there yourself. But you need someone to reflect it back to you, that that burning is there because we forget. That's what I think childhood is about, domestication. It's, a, it's the forgetting, being born again and forgetting, forgetting what we once maybe knew. Yeah, and, uh, you know, the domestication is something that, uh, that we all go through, and we all sometimes think about childhood experiences as being um, harsh or being wrong. They're, they're teaching us beliefs that aren't true. Uh, and we can't do much about it when we're one to seven years old. And so, uh, you know, how how do we uh, how do we get over that? How do we unlearn some of that stuff and still honor it and treasure it as a part of us? Well, for me, it's practice. So handstands is what you've seen me do, but I've spent the last ten years practicing meditation and specifically in the last seven years mantra meditation or, or chanting it's called many different names japa the silent uttering of divine names it has many different names but it's essentially using a sound and repeating it instead of listening to the thoughts in your head and beginning to feel your body to be in in this whether you call it a temple whatever you call it this treasure that we've been given in this lifetime and beginning to 
repeat those sounds gives me the opportunity while paying attention to my body and being here and present with you, I can begin instead of thinking about what I'm going to say next to you or what question you might ask, I can feel the warmth in my chest. As soon as we got on the call before we even started, I felt the warmth of the four of us gathering. And that, that's something that I can rest on instead of resting on my thoughts and what I might say, I can rest on this warmth. So it, I use whatever I can to do those things. Mantras, one thing, handstands, learning to you know, get on a skateboard. I mean, they're silly things at some level, but they're things that I'm afraid of. So I did them because moving into that fear and that uncomfortability helps me to be able to show up for my kids when they need me to be patient and kind, when I'm maybe unsettled inside myself when there's someone dying and I'm sitting with them in hospice and holding their hand, I need to be here and present if I really want to be able to give what was given to me through my mentors and through teachers like Miguel and their teachings. I love when you, when you talked about your kids because we have a lot of mothers and fathers here in our audience and many of them have young kids. And school is a place where in general, uh, I would say, you know, there's so many different ways of thought. There's so many different ways that the different families, you know, raise their kids. And what you said that you teach your kids to, or you tell them to be odd <laughs> <laughs> in order to appreciate, you know, the odd, the oddness of, of, of everybody else. How would you, you know, I think that most of the kids try to fit in, you know, try to be like part of, of a whole uh, and try to please everybody. How, how can you teach a kid which is a still, you know, a human being which is being formed? How, how do you do it with your own kids? How do you teach them to be themselves uh, and not uh, always wanting to be pleasing to everybody else? You know, the only way that I can do it, and I've asked this question a lot, I used to be an educator, I used to be a teacher, and when the kids came, all my stuff came at me, you know, all my own domesticated from childhood. And what I have come to and what has worked for our children is us being odd, me choosing to be who I am and them seeing that because they see. We go to the playground after school and I let them play and I sit there and, you know, I have beads and I just sit and chant. You know, sometimes I'll talk to other parents, but a lot of the times I just sit. And I'm just content with myself. But that's taken years of practice of being in, in the, the park, being in nature and just sitting with them and just allowing them to grow this creativity. And nature would be on the top of my list of how to be odd because in nature, you have nothing that is going to grab your attention, but you have everything that can totally absorb your attention and be in awe. So they make little fairy houses, which means... They take little sticks and rocks and all those things and they build it. And each time is a new creation and there's a gathering that happens and there's all these different things. My point being is I bring them to nature and I do something that engages myself but isn't distracted. I'm not on a phone. I'm not doing something. So they know I'm totally present for them if they need me. So I give them my time and I do what I do. I, I ride a skateboard that no, no dad that I've ever met rides a skateboard. I, I chant all the time and they know Sanskrit and that, that's an odd thing. And they know that's odd. They know that wow. that's not normal and they chant. I mean, they get up during live streams sometimes when they're feeling brave and they share which mantra they want to do. So they get the opportunity to speak their voice and to share. And when I find something they love, and when I find their oddness, I nurture that. So with my daughter, it was knitting. It was like, how can I do this? I don't know how to knit. We got on YouTube. We take her to this, the knitting place and nurture this, this thing that she wants to create and use her hands. So it's finding those things they love and sharing that and then finding the things that I love. Because as a parent, you know, what do we do? We get lost in work. We get lost in being responsible and, and upraising them in a good way, getting them to the right school but we lose ourselves. And that's an important thing to find ourselves so they can find themselves. And what do the school teachers say? About my kids? Yes. That they are unique, that they are unique. I mean, 
Bodhi, one of the most proud moments I had last year, and he was, he's in kindergarten this year in preschool. There was a young girl who had gotten, um, we'll just say a rash all over her body. And all the other kids were making fun of her. And Bodhi said, stop. And I mean, can you imagine being that age and knowing that having the sensitivity to know that she was hurting and to tell other people to stop? And those are the type of things that at, at the age of preschool, we, we tend to conform, if anything, if, at most. But those little things are the things and how they're able to really move into something. They're able to engage in a level. And I, I, I don't take credit. Of, I give nature, Mother Earth, the credit of that. They're able to focus extremely long periods of time because that's all they know. You, you, you engage. And that's the noticeable things that they're teachers, that they're kind and that they're engaged. That would be the two things that are most noticeable about the kids, I would say. Wow, that's amazing. That's such a... Uh, a perspective, you know, that uh, it, it seems like it, it may almost be impossible for children to be unique and to uh, nurture their own uh, diversity and, and out of the pressure to conform, out of the pressures and the, and the, and the rules that they're given as they're growing up and entering the larger society. But if you can get that nurtured, that, that um, awareness of uniqueness and value of it uh, embedded in a person at an early age, they will grow up that way. They will grow up uh, valuing themselves and not hiding themselves so much. I think that's amazing. I just, you know, I, I've raised two children and uh, they're all grown up now and they are probably uh, struggling with what they have to unlearn. So I just so appreciate your focus on allowing children to be authentic. So, um, Michael, <clears throat> when we introduce you, um, you know, we're talking about you being an author. And mm -hmm. uh, also Stan mentioned that you are right now recording an audiobook. So what is, what is the book about? What do, you, what do you talk about in your book? So the book is called Open. And it's mantra me meditation for personal healing and self mastery. And it's really the story how I use mantra specifically, but you could use anything. It could be any sort of love, passion, and how I use that to overcome my story. And, and the basic premise of it is that we're either stuck in our story, we're talking about our problem, or we make an act of will where we say, no, right now in this moment, I'm not going to give that attention. So right now I'm recording, I finished the recording of the audiobook. The book's been around now for two years and I've been doing the teachings. It was based on five years of finding techniques that could help people integrate meditation practices and retreats into their life because I would go to Teo and I would go to meditation practices and I've, I've had a lot of experience going to these things. And then you come home and it's like, you know, there's kids crawling on you. It's not silent anymore. It's not this peaceful thing where everyone's serving you food and asking you what you need next. It's, it's the reverse. You're now that person in service. And how do you deal with that? You go from this place of immense light, love. You're with all these people. And now real life has come and approached you. So the, the book is the how do you integrate these practices? How do you take your experiences of these internal messages you receive or you go on a retreat, whatever it is, and how do you actually start putting that into practice in your life? So there's a morning practice, an afternoon practice, and an evening practice, one that helps you build more awareness, one that helps heal emotional wounds, and one that helps you awaken to sort of find that uniqueness within, your, within yourself. And when you, when you were writing the book, and now that you're record, or you just recorded the audiobook, what did you have in mind? Did you, did you have in mind some, some specific audience? Honestly, I didn't. You know, they say when you write a book, you need an audience, you need all this thing. I woke up at 12 o'clock midnight after falling asleep really early one night, and I had to write, and it had to come out of me. And I spent a month. I, I primarily, for the last 
nine years have stayed home with my kids. So my wife, we made a decision that she would work because of how society is that she would do that. So I stayed home for nine years and stayed with my kids. And that being said, when it came though, it was a, a month and a half of me writing, editing, and I was gone. It was, it, was, it was truly an experience where I feel so blessed. Something was coming to me and I just had to get it out of me. And I just spent you know, hours and hours a day getting it out, getting it out, getting it out, refining it. And fortunately, I'm a big idea person and my wife is about the details. So she brings me back to reality. So the process of who is for didn't really trickle out and how to shape it until after it came out of me. So, so your book open is published and available for purchase? It is, it is. Okay, so open, and you said it had a, a sub subtitle of mantra meditation for personal healing and self mastery. Okay, so I could just go on to Amazon or someplace like that and find your book and buy it. You could find it on Amazon and buy it. Yes. Okay, so Michael Nardi, open. Yes, <laughs> and open. The whole premise of open is open your heart. We are so we are so stopped and clogged up, especially as men. I mean, if there was an audience, I would say it's for parents because I'm a parent and I was trying to share how I went from domestication to opening my heart despite that those old wounds coming up. And I didn't want to impress those onto my children. What if we could not domesticate our children? What if we could share our wisdom but not share our dysfunction? And that was the premise of the book, Open Your Heart open your feelings. We're so apt to just shut it down, close it off. And this is a, a means by which chanting, when you chant out loud, if I make the sound, Ram, it might seem silly. And the first time I have people chant, they feel silly. But in the same instance, it's very hard to not have a heart that's open, energy that's flowing when you're chanting. Singing, you could do instead. But in the way that I teach and I'm a teacher, it's, it's a set way that I can pass a message where people can receive it and experience it. And it takes them out of their comfort zone. We're so afraid to use our voice. We're so afraid to speak, but to sing, that's really scary. I mean, to speak our mind is one thing, but to sing, it, it confronts something deep inside of us that as a kid, we were told, stop singing. You have an ugly voice or stop drawing, whatever it was. So that is impressed upon the very act of making sound. And I like that because it's right from day one, you're challenging yourself in a new way that you might not have encountered previously. Is it possible to learn your chants from the audiobook? Oh, absolutely. You can, so that's the other thing. When I read Miguel's books, there, if I could say one thing that affected me most out of a book, I'd say the wisdom series of Miguel's books. The thing I couldn't do was build awareness by myself in my home. So I went off and I went to meditation places and I spent thousands of hours learning to meditate, but I couldn't teach that to anyone unless they went on the mountain too. So the whole point of the book, other than what I've already described is that you can learn from home. The sounds are easy. You can make the sound Ram and Ram's a good sound when you're angry. So the choice becomes I'm angry and I'm gonna feed into it and I might spit that poison out in my loved ones, which we all don't want to do and regret afterwards, or I can make this basic sound, R plus ah plus mm, and I make the sound Ram, and I repeat that, and then I take that energy that is some dysfunctional energy inside myself, and then I put it out there to achieve a goal instead of putting it towards my family or myself and rejecting something. So in the audiobook, it leads with the sounds, and you hear my voice, and that's a goal I had to make it into an audio book, but things take time as you guys know. But in the book, it has it all written out and you still can do it and I tell you how to pronounce it and they're easy sounds. But the goal of the audio book is for people to hear it because that's such a, a positive and powerful thing. And that's why I have live feeds and I have also my podcast, the Michael Nardi podcast, which just has a, a plethora of different experiences, stories and me chanting so that you can just hear and become familiar in that way, to normalize it to a varying degree. Wow, that's really interesting. When I was a younger man, I used to, uh, to meditate. I was living in Japan, 
And, uh, but I was listening and finding different kinds of um, mantras and meditation uh, styles. But uh, one of them had to do with, you know, like you said, um, speaking and, and using sounds. And one of them, well, I would read these mantras in books but i wouldn't know the sounds of them <laughs> and kind of make them up from my my uh english background and uh, try to figure out what were what were the sounds like and there were some amazing mantras like om mani padme hum i don't even know how to say it totally they pronounce it in two different ways anyway so you have om mani padme hum which is like the Sanskrit way to say it. And then there's Om Mani Padmi Hung or Pay Me Hung. So there's a million different ways. So what I did with the book is the very thing of most people, myself included, I, I try to research it, learn it, go take courses. And there's this confusion. What do I do? And when we're confused, we won't move forward. We'll, 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 we'll stop right there. It's just the closing of the door. And another thing that happens also that happens with mantra is that it's religious which I'm not going to say anything negative about religion, but in that it separates you from the experience. There's Hinduism, there's Buddhism, but with chanting, it's really in the way that I teach it. It's about connecting with yourself and finding God, the infinite spirit inside yourself. So from that, taking out those, those, those blockers, those walls that people face when they want to try something new like chanting, that's my goal. Can I remove the things that are unnecessary challenges? Because like you said, what do I chant? And then you doubt yourself. You're like, am I chanting this right? Is this working? I don't know. Exactly. That, that's, the, that's the internal chatter, right? That's what we, <laughs> we are continually doing. And um, how, do you, how did you start a journey, your own journey of healing other people, Michael? So when I was 25 years old, I, you know, it, I got a message, actually, was, we were 24 years old, I'll say. We lived in Atlanta, Georgia. At that point in time, my wife and I branded, bought a brand new house. It was during the boom. And, and you know, you could get a house at 24, just buy one. And everything was perfect. It was beautiful. But there was something empty in both our lives that we were wanting. And we just, we, we, we were stuck. We got a phone call. And I knew I had one of those moments where you just know something. And I'm like, we're moving to Philadelphia. What's, what's going on? My mother-in-law was diagnosed with breast cancer. And the next year we spent watching her die. A horrible death because of modern westernized medicine, which again, Western medicine is very good. You get in a car accident, you, you're not going to be able to do healing in the way that I might do healing. There's a time and a place for everything. So I'm not saying that. But watching her die unnecessarily was a very traumatic experience. And she had a very, beyond the year, the actual death experience led to, again, this call inside myself. This is, this is what it's all about, us watching her die. And there was no consolation. And I didn't know what to do. You know, I, I, I needed to be brave for everyone. I, I was the one who gave her eulogy. I was 25 years old, though. I didn't, I didn't know what to do. And I helped out. We, we helped support her family. I put her sister through college for a semester through my own income. I went to the other sister's school. I tried to be perfect. I tried to help. Again, I went to the resort of giving, giving, giving. And then I was finally so empty. I, it nearly destroyed me. And I learned Reiki. I, I, I picked up this book. I had heard this thing, Reiki. I didn't understand it. I didn't know anything about it. But I went to New York City and all of a sudden I learned hands-on healing. And from there it went to, I found myself in the seminary as I kept on asking these questions. And I was in the seminary and we kept on talking about what the right way to talk about the Bible was. I just, again, I, was, there's something more I was looking for. And I'm like, I need to help people. I need to actually engage. So then I ended up working in hospice and doing hands-on healing in hospice. And I opened my own healing practice at that time. So I worked predominantly in an 18-bed house, but I also went and did home visits, especially for children or people with um, diseases that could allow them to be in their own home 
but they still needed out service sources. So I would, I would come in and I'd hold time with them, whether it was just to listen to them, to relieve pain, to help them sleep, or a mother to just help her through the process of watching her child die, or the staff who got attached to people and burnout was so heavily, just giving them a half an hour to rest, restore, recharge their batteries. And that started my journey into healing. Wow. Yeah. Oh. Go ahead, go ahead. I had a question uh, uh, regarding, I know you, I met you in a uh, faraway place. I, I know you've been to India. I, I'm just curious if you think that these travels to faraway places, uh, I mean, I've been in faraway places and uh, are, they been, are they necessary? Do we need to do these things in order for our, us to open up our hearts and to follow these practices of loving and sharing kindness in the world? Do we need, the answer, to, do we need to, the to answer, take these trips? The answer is yes for me because I did. No, you don't. You know, the trip can be something that shifts perspective. So one thing it does is brings you in a new culture and a new place, and you can't rest on your normal tendencies, your normal behaviors, and you see the beauty of other cultures, and it opens up things in us. And I think that when we go to a place, sometimes it awakens something in us. It, it sparks something in us. But no, we don't. If the greatest messages I always receive are like the book, The Al Alchemist. You know the book? Yes. The Alchemist. In the end... The whole story is about, it's all about coming back to where you started. And it's all about coming back to your own heart. The answers reside in here. But for some of us, like myself, I'm a slow learner. So I've traveled <laughs> to India. So I've traveled to Mexico. So I've done those things. And really, to my, the problem with those things, if there is a problem, is that how do I integrate that experience? And if I start there, it's so discongruent to my own life. I miss an opportunity. If I think I need to be somewhere else, if I think I, I should be in Teo, Tiwakan, or India, and I'm with my child right now, what message am I really sending them? Right? If, if that's the answer of what's going to heal me, can I really be present for them? And the answer always comes back is like, no, I have to be yearning to want to be here as bad as I want to be in all these magical, mystical places. Can I make my life mystical? Can I make my life magical? Can I light a candle and share a story to my child and open a world to them of imagination? Because really when I go on these long journeys, that's what happens. My childlike imagination gets kindled again. I see things that I don't get to see in the repetitiveness, the repetitiveness of my day-to-day -day life. Yeah, I, uh, I, I attended a workshop several years ago uh, called uh, something to do with, with synchronicity. And, uh, and it, in that workshop, one of the things I learned was that the way to increase synchronicity in your life is to go to places that you've never been before. And I've thought about that because I study psychology and all that stuff. And, and it makes sense that when you go to a place you've never been before, all of your senses are alerted are increased. The acuity increases because you, you don't know this place and you don't know where the dangers are. You don't know where, uh, where you have to go. And so it does, like you say, open you to receiving and seeing a whole lot more that may have been there all along and you just didn't see it because of the habitual way that we run our lives. And so I, I just really wanted to highlight that. I think, uh, you, you don't have to go to India, perhaps, but maybe you can take another route home from work or you can walk down a street that you never walk down and just do things out of the ordinary, be a little odd, so to speak. I would fully agree. How do you mix up your how do you mix up the things that become habitual? How do you change the elements of your day to day life that they become new and fresh? Because that is what awakening is. You know, when you think of a great saint of india or you think of a great teacher spiritually or just a person that you respect that has presence they're paying attention always mm -hmm. they're always in this state of awe and wonder they're in a state of something that's like a child 
but they also have developed their wisdom, which children have an in inherent wisdom, but life teaches us. And as I get older, I don't want to go back to being 17 or 27, and now I'm 37, and I hope that will always continue. I want to be where I am because I've been back there, but I can share something to someone that has a problem they're in right now that maybe I've had an experience with, a personal experience. I can listen to them and I can share that experience and then it has value. Wow. How, could, how can you, do you think that everybody can be healed? Absolutely. I mean, well, let's, can you rephrase the question in the sense of, are we talking in what parameters? Yeah, so, you know, you, you, you are a healer, so you help people. You help people to be healed from different avenues, I guess, of uh, challenges in their lives. So do you think that everybody really has, because you spoke and you talked about the story of your mother-in-law and how she died and when you were still young, and that triggers a lot of different things inside of you. Mm -hmm. So after, after that, and you know, fast forward and all your experience, do you think that everybody can be healed? See, the question, what I, the way that I would go about answering is, the, what are we trying to solve? If we're trying to overcome a disease, I don't know that everyone can be healed. You know, something to the, the form of ALS. I, I, I'm listening to Tuesdays with Maury, another great book, you know, about a man and his story of dying. And, ALS is one of those things that maybe they'll solve that. And maybe some great healer can lay their hands on someone and heal that. But it's one of those things that it's not about confronting the disease. It's about confronting the heart and staying open while going through that disease. And I truly believe if you're trying to cure something, it's the wrong angle with healing. It's what can I learn from this experience and how can I be more present in the experience? And why is, it, you know, why is it happening not to get that why me God question, but what is it that is unique to me in this situation that I'm learning, that I'm the unique person that is going through this? You are you know, the hero of your life. And why are you going through this process? If, if there's something that needs to be healed, and I know some of the processes I've went through, like watching my mother-in-law die helped me to sit with people through hospice. And hospice is palliative care. It's not about the disease anymore. It's about making the person comfortable and having those conversations that you might have missed, like we missed with my mother-in-law, because she tried to fight the disease and we tried to help her fight the disease and everyone was fighting and no one was having those conversations, those intimate conversations, sharing hopes and dreams. You know, I had one with her, one conversation where she, she surrendered and that stuck with me. And she just shared her worries, her thoughts. We weren't talking about what would happen now and what she was going through, but what would happen to her daughters and those kind of things. And in hospice, those conversations happen. So it isn't about curing the disease, but I believe if you want to heal your heart, if there's something wrong inside you that you feel that's confronting and that you want to change, I believe we all instead of saying can be healed, can change. If we choose it, we can change. And that change can happen in any moment that we're ready to say yes to it. And it goes back to the first question, the decision. What changed me is I made a decision that it was time for change. Okay, Beautiful. That, that word surrender you used um, reminds me of a, a, one of my favorite teachers, Michael J. Singer. He actually mm -hmm. wrote a book. He wrote a book called The Surrender Experiment, uh, which to me had a very powerful Im impact on how I look at uh, facing uh, adversity and facing situations that are not uh, pleasant and cheerful. Um, and I really, I really like that, uh, what he says about everything we encounter, whether it be good or not feeling good uh, is kind of a preparation for our next step. And I'm kind of curious um, about what is your next step and what kinds of experiences are you having right now that are preparing you for the next step? So the Surrender Experiment, highly recommend that book. I've read that book too. And it is actually where I'm at 
in my life. It's truly to let things come. It, it is that point. There, the engaging the will is an important thing. So I learn how to do handstands and I do things that challenge me, but I do it not because I want to achieve a handstand. I want to do it to see how I respond to myself learning a handstand. Am I going to just push so hard that I'm injuring my body, that I'm judging myself? Am I going to do this thing? And I start watching the patterns of how I go about getting something done. And that's a beautiful process in life to start making goals for yourself to see how you respond but personal goals not something that it requires someone else to achieve them responding to you something you can look back at yourself and clearly see that being said that'll only take you so far at some point you have to just give in and surrender and as i move past the experiences of acting on my will I really, my hope is to, to truly learn how to surrender. My greatest goal, to be honest, is to sit in Padmasana when I die, which is cross-legged, and be able to consciously leave my body with no regret. And what that means is I'm constantly throughout my life trying to let go, forgive. If I'm holding a grudge versus myself or versus another person, I want to let go of all those things. And I haven't. Because if I did, I would be content. And surrendering is about learning how to let go to me. And that's where I'm going. There are things that I would like to be different in the world. But I can change myself and I make that act of will. But how do I let go and let it unfold to the beauty of meeting you and Teo, not having a conversation there, but weeks later, being sitting here with Angel as well and sharing us discussing that that's the magic of synchronicity that that's something that now if i had planned i wanted this to happen how would it would ever have happened i would have forced it i would have missed giving you a hug i would have there would have been something that i would have tried to control that wouldn't allow the universe life whatever you call it the unfoldment to come so my goal is to really start doing that more and more and where i see it is i've learned some practices i've learned techniques my kids are now, I'm at this crossroads. They, they, I've put them through staying at home with them for nine years. And I've, I've done various retreats and I've worked during that time because I need to work sometimes. I need to not be mama. I need to get out in the world. I need to go visit India and I need to do those things. But now they're in school. That's how the mothers out there feel sometimes, huh? Absolutely. You, you've got to find you. And, and I think that's the, if you want to give something to your kid as a mother, and I'm speaking as a father, mother, but I'm a mother. I've caregiven since my daughter was six weeks old. I was there with her 11 hours a day when my wife was working crazy East Coast hours. And I can say the greatest gift you can give them is finding yourself so that they can find themselves. And I'm at this crossroad where I was done with nine years of staying at home. And it's like, okay, we have a business and I support the business in various different ways. But it was like, oh, four months ago, or five months ago, it was like, what are you gonna do? Now you have all this free time. Bodhi's in kindergarten, he's a full-time student. You can go off. And I, that's, I chose to learn a handstand because I needed to reconnect with me before I dove right in into full-time work again and helping the students and clients that we have and all that. So I'm at the crossroads of starting a new dream and going this past trip was about, where do I wanna go from here? What's the next step of how I want to offer my dream to the world? What services can I give? Wow. Beautiful. Yeah. We have to wrap it up. Um, Michael, I would like to make sure that uh, the audience knows where to find you. If they want to speak with you or they want to buy uh, your book, where can we go online, Michael? MichaelAnthonyNardi.com. And our office, our studio is embodyashland.com. So either one will help you find the podcast. And that's free on iTunes as well. The Michael Nardi podcast and all the other various information you might need, you can find it there. Excellent. Wonderful. Um, Stan, how can we find you? Oh, well, my uh, website is www.healingexchangecenter.com. 
And my phone number is posted on that uh, website, but I'll give it to you at 661-733-8444. And that will also help me receive text. So uh, if, if I don't answer, because sometimes uh, I don't, uh, leave a text or a message. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much, Michael. It's been a, an honor to get to know your story, to get to know what you do and why you do it. There's a lot of things that have resonated with uh, our audience for sure and with me personally, definitely. <laughs> so apparently we are all three on a surrender experiment right now. So, <laughs> so, so that you know. <laughs> That's beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is. So yeah, so we are just embracing the next, you know, the next stage in our lives. So it's not a coincidence, obviously, that we have we, we have been talking today. Um, consider Mind Dahlia TV your home moving forward. Thank you again. Oh, thank being, you so much for being with us today, and thank you, Stan, for bringing the amazing Michael Nardi here with us today. Thank you so much. I'm so blessed to get to know you, Michael. It's been a pleasure, Stan. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Will you be at Teo? Uh, the next new year? Uh, there's always that possibility. <laughs> <laughs> excellent, excellent. So thank you again. This is Angel Rebo with my Dahlia TV. Thank you very much for being with us today. I hope that you have enjoyed our conversation as much as we have here. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, hope to see you soon. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.